TikTok edits might be the most captivating and persuasive form of media there is right now. I don't know why we don't talk about these people actually having superpowers, but have you seen how good editors are? Editors are creating trends. I just have to say edits are the real marketing of film and TV. Everything you think is cool, yeah, an editor created that. Every person you think is cool or hot or sexy, an editor made you think that. I will go out of my way 90% of the time if I see an edit of one hot person from a movie or a show. I, I spend like 50% of my time on this app watching edits. And they're not just affecting the film and TV industries. They're affecting every realm of information, education, business, politics, you name it. Edits are playing an integral role in how people are getting introduced to topics and how they continue to keep up with them. Jeffrey Epstein. Why is there a Jeffrey Epstein edit? Bro, bro, who made this edit, bro? No, and then who posted this shit to yo? A Jeffrey Epstein edit is crazy. Like, what the fuck, yo? What the? What the fuck? What the fuck? I mean, he was powerful. <laughs> Yo, he was powerful. Yo, can someone link me at this song? I like this song. Mali Ma Beat. While edits have had various evolutions in their current form, I think a good definition is compilation videos typically set to music that convey a narrative about a person, place, thing, or topic. Let's watch an example. The mother to elevate the man. They're gonna propagate the killer, eliminate the youth. They're gonna blind date everyone until you love them too. Digital style, digital hate, digital guy, digital pain, digital violence, digital world, digital boy needs, digital girl, digital silence, digital yell, digital heaven. This edit was accompanied by comments like, I would be so much more invested in politics if it was delivered with supporting edits I can hyperfixate on. That comment has 75,000 likes. Another comment was, I think we need to band together and make nonstop political edits through 2024. None of us are willing to protest together in person. It's clear that this form of media significance needs to be better attended to. In the past, I've only seen coverage of edits focus on four things. One, how this is a popular form of content that is only being created more and more. Two, how those who create edits have the ability to make clips take on an entirely new meaning and provoke strong emotions in viewers. Three, how they're geared towards TV, film, and music as that's the realm of culture this form of media originated. And lastly, four, the debate around edits in terms of copyright and or other infringements. But today, we're covering how the power of edits is far greater than just those observations. Because as this person stated, you can convince people of anything if you put it in a TikTok with a catchy sound. So sit back and relax because this video is gonna encapsulate everything you need to have on your radar about the present day and near future potential of edits. Before we dive in, I want to share my appreciation for this video's partner, Backmarket. I'm always thankful to work with them, and today we're focused on something other than your ability to purchase high-quality refurbished tech from their website. Here's the deal. Backmarket also allows you to trade in your phones, MacBooks, tablets, gaming consoles, and or audio devices so that you, one, can get rid of technology you no longer need without further contributing to the growing e-waste issue, and two, can provide affordable refurbished technology to someone else. Oh, and by the way, you get cash for it straight into your bank account, just a win all around. Head to Back Market's Trade In Your Tech webpage, choose your device, choose the model, brand, type, storage capacity, all that. Depending on the device, you might need some other context. For example, if it's a phone, you'll need to know if it's unlocked or locked to a specific carrier. Choose the condition, cracked, used, good, or flawless. Declare its functionality. And then lastly, decide to decline or accept the offer before heading to get the device shipped. That's it. Only takes about two minutes to get set up. Backmarket is my go-to when considering buying tech, and you can try out the experience via the link in my description. Now let's get into the video. I want to interject here because YouTube chapters are a beautiful thing. This video is a bit lengthy. I want it to work for you and YouTube chapters makes it super simple. The current storyline I have 
is setting the tone, general information, which we just went over. Then we're going into history and background information. Then we're going into a bunch of different examples in a bunch of different realms. And then lastly, quickly hitting the future of edits. Now, this is the storyline that works best for my brain. Maybe it doesn't work best for yours. If you're someone who doesn't give a fuck about history and background information, use YouTube chapters, skip over it, and go right to the examples, starting with education. Though I will say, I think history and background information is going to make the current day examples more valuable and interesting to you, but to each their own, do as you please. Or maybe you're someone who doesn't really know what edits are and those examples are going to help you really internalize the importance of them and then you want to go to history and background information. That's fine. You can jump around the storyline, use YouTube chapters, whatever works best for you. But maybe you're like me and your brain is going to operate best with the current storyline. Then ignore YouTube chapters. But I'm just saying you can make this video work for you. Super simple. XOXO YouTube chapters. The history of edits is pretty wild. In the past, edits have also been referenced as vidding, fan vids, and fan edits, but I feel like we've outgrown putting such an emphasis on the word fan. In 2007, Henry Jenkins published a piece titled Afterward, The Future of Fandom, where he questioned, as fandom becomes such an elastic category, one starts to wonder, who isn't a fan? What doesn't constitute fan culture? Where does grassroots culture end and commercial culture begin? Where does niche media start to blend over into the mainstream. With edits now affecting all areas of culture, alongside our lives becoming more digital and our online consumption putting such an emphasis on entertainment, it seems like that blend is well on its way. But let's take a look at where edits originated within TV, film, and music. According to Mashable, the very first fan edit can be traced back to 1975, when Star Trek fan Candy Fong made a slideshow of Star Trek outtakes inspired by the Beatles' music video for Strawberry Fields Forever. In a 2012 interview, Fong described the light bulb moment. The Beatles weren't just standing there and playing instruments, like all the music performances you'd seen to date. And I thought, duh, this guy I'm dating has cigar boxes full of film from Star Trek. I could put those together and tell a story. She premiered her slideshow at Equicon, a Star Trek fan convention. First edit dating back 50 years is pretty shocking, but until the birth of the internet and its mainstream adoption in the 90s, the culture around edits was pretty quiet. That is, until Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Edit happened in 2000. It's different than what we're seeing on TikTok, but still very important in the evolution. The Phantom Edit was a direct response to Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace from a fan who was displeased with various elements of the film. As a film editor, he took it upon himself to remove those elements from the original from the comfort of his home computer. According to the editor, the Phantom Edit was simply intended for personal viewing, but a video cassette version that he shared with a friend was unexpectedly duplicated and distributed by unknown persons at parties around Hollywood in 2000 to 2001. And from there, it spread onto the internet. The Phantom Edit received coverage from various major news outlets and caused a stir around the ethics of something like this, creatively, legally, and so on. The edit even reached the creator of Star Wars, George Lucas, who didn't have much to say other than, well, everybody wants to be a filmmaker. Part of what I was hoping for with making movies in the first place was to inspire people to be creative. The Phantom Edit was fine as long as they didn't start selling it. Once they started selling it, it became a piracy issue. While the original editor wasn't trying to sell it, others on the internet were, and aside from legal issues being the most obvious, other critiques remained. In a New York Times piece, the vice president of Lucasfilm had a different point of view than George Lucas himself stating, we love our fans, we want them to have fun, but if somebody is using our characters to create a story unto itself, that's not in the spirit of what we think fandom is about. Fandom is about celebrating the story the way it is. In a 2004 piece, Nikki Pope said, digital technology scares the entertainment industry and rightly so. Not only are they losing control over the distribution of their products, they are also losing control over the actual product. The Phantom Edit is a very literal form of a fan edit. It's an alternative version of a full film created by a fan. Again, this is much different than the TikTok example I showed earlier, and it also presents a different sentiment than the one shared by Brooke and Sophie, who said that short-form edits actually prompt them to watch original works that they never would have considered on their own. TikTok edits essentially serve as free marketing for shows and films, but in the case of the Phantom edit, people could have suggested that others watch the fan edit version instead of the original. Websites like fanedit.org, which launched in 2006, are filled with alternative versions of shows and movies. As platforms like YouTube and Instagram rose up, edits became much more bite-sized and hyper-fixated on individuals and moments, though still just within TV, film, and music. My, and probably many other people's, first exposure to edits was whenever I would look through public figures tagged media on Instagram. But today, now that public figures often, and rightfully, 
turn off the tag feature, aside from being exposed to edits on reels potentially, there's a new boss in town. In comes TikTok and how it skyrocketed the popularity of edits. Remember Candy Fong who made the first fan edit in 1975? The creation of that edit required clips of 35mm film that were mounted into slides and showcased through a slide projector alongside a cassette tape player. But as stated in the history of vidding, she now had music, video, and source. The three main ingredients to make a fan edit. 50 years later, those three things are still the main ingredients to make an edit. And with TikTok, they are far more accessible than ever before. In the reverse order of what was just stated, let's start with Source. While Candy Fong obtained video for her edit through film, we're now able to both access plus obtain video easily through our phones. The ability to screenshot and screen record caused a major shift for editors. Screenshots were introduced to both iPhones and Androids in 2007, but screen recording was introduced to iPhones in 2017 and Androids in 2018 for some, and 2020 for others. While this feature often doesn't work on something like streaming services, which pushes editors to revert to more traditional digital sourcing like desktop softwares, the ability to screen record has broadened the creation of edits to be focused on things outside of just the TV, music, and film industries. Sourcing that also caused the shift in edit culture was the ability to download other people's videos directly to your camera roll from social media. I don't know if I've seen this discussed anywhere, but TikTok pioneered the built-in download function, which is just wild. I thought it was Vine, but no, people were utilizing third-party services. On that platform, at one point, you were able to download your own videos. But again, we're talking about the ability to download other people's videos to your camera roll. And now, other social media platforms are following TikTok's lead. All right, now the second ingredient, video. As stated in the history of bidding, Candy selected film clips that she felt advanced the story and arranged them in order in the slide carousel. She then manually started the cassette tape player and followed the lyrics along using a script or storyboard and clicked the projector to advance each slide. These early fan edits were very much like performance art as they were done live, were not recorded, and the timing of the clicks had to match the lyrics. That's a lot to think about considering we now have editing softwares on our phones like CapCut. By Dance, TikTok's parent company, acquired CapCut in 2018 and it now has more than 490 million users. Knowledge from this platform has helped TikTok have in-app editing features that no other social media platforms have. And with CapCut's further integration with TikTok in 2023, the platform is managing to just further democratize video editing. Easy access to something like templates allows anyone to fast track their skills, play into trends, and then directly upload their finished product to the platform. As stated in a New York Times piece, digital tools make it easier for fans to produce more sophisticated works and to distribute them to a worldwide audience. And as stated in a Mashable piece about fan edits, editors can manipulate even the most mundane clip into something romantic or devastating. Enhancing the emotion with a carefully curated music choice, they are works of art open to interpretation. While this isn't just the case of edits and has always been true of video editing as a whole. My specific style of video creation up until my break now was very much like, hey, here's me doing nothing. Yep. And then editing it in a certain way that basically gaslights you, the audience, into thinking that what I'm doing is interesting. TikTok has made video editing a typical and intuitive user experience. The same way Instagram kind of made photo editing, or at least adding filters, a typical user experience. In turn, this has pushed edits to become a dominant form of how users share, especially those who wish to stay anonymous, and consume information. The last and third ingredient, Music. While TikTok isn't the first social media platform to have in-app access to copyrighted music, after ByteDance initially acquired Musical.ly to merge with the platform in 2018, the company significantly expanded its music library through licensing agreements with labels. The ability to utilize just about any song or sound without repercussions was an extremely refreshing concept within the social media world for users and broadened the possibilities of content. And of course, TikTok has always been improving their music integrations, which allows users to more seamlessly add and synchronize music to their videos. So all of these things just play a role in how TikTok skyrocketed at its popularity. But what makes edits? These compilation videos set to music that convey a narrative about a person, place, thing, or topic so captivating and persuasive. One reason is that edits are a sort of social signal. Media from a third person point of view signals more power than media from a first person point of view. And that power is embodied by edits because one, they're always about something or someone from a third person point of view conveying a narrative. Two, it's 
pretty much a guarantee that you're going to experience a high level emotion related to entertainment from them. And three, they're very recognizable on your For You page. There's a certain frequency and energy that exudes from them. They're not all quick paced. Some are actually pretty slow paced at first, but I don't know, you just know when an edit is coming on your For You page. They hit a lot of attention hacks. Morgan Dawn put it well, fan edits bypass our higher cognitive functions and aim straight for our limbic center where we laugh, where we sing, and where we cry. When I had ChatGPT interpret this quote, it said that edits bypass more analytical thinking and instead speak directly to our feelings and emotional experiences. People who are foreign to edits will likely write them off as unserious because of this reality. While they're correct in a sense, generally it's wrong to dismiss edits because their role is only bound to grow. In 2017, a University of Kansas PhD student wrote their dissertation on fan edits stating remarkably little scholarship offers sustained direct attention as a subject of fan edits. Fan editing briefly appears in the context of broader examinations of law, policy, authorship, and media fandom. Putting aside the fact that academia and institutions are deemed slow in the 21st century, this is an issue with the internet, but especially social media, where snooty tweet types think they're above giving platform developments and or user behavior their attention, they deem it unserious, and then the significance just passes them by. TikTok's first years as a platform is a prime example of this. You don't have to participate in something yourself, but ignoring or even denying its impact, that's just silly. Here are examples of how edits are already making huge impacts within various facets of culture. Let's start with education because this one probably has the most intense example. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, this edit garnered more than 53 million views, 8 million likes, and 180,000 comments. In your gut, something might have not sat right when watching that, or something we're better off without, and it seems like turning the situation into an edit turns it into some sort of spectacle. While edits are best known for their romanticization or idealization of individuals and projects within TV, film, and music, I think the word spectacle best represents what they create more broadly. A spectacle is defined as a visually striking performance or display. And in the case of war, creating such an effect through media can distance viewers from its true horrors and complexities. But with that being said, one could argue that this edit actually did way more good than harm. One commenter who garnered nearly 150,000 likes stated this. Everyone's going on about the fact that this person made an edit, but this is literally educational to me. I had no idea what was going on. She's right. This is how you effectively break through the noise and communicate information in a way that is second nature to how younger generations consume content today, for better or worse. Unlike many edits, this one also pushed no agenda or opinion. It just stayed the facts. Its net impact, as she said, was educational. I'd argue that this information could not garner the same amount of attention from such an audience through any other media approach. The energy cultivated through the music, visuals, and transitions makes the information more immersive and alluring than any other format. And while this brings the potential for like PSYOP level harm, it also brings the potential for immense good if used with the right intentions. Yin and yang people, my favorite concept. But seriously, there's a major disconnect between how students enjoy consuming content in their personal lives and how they're forced to consume content in school. While I obviously agree that there are important principles that traditional teaching, so textbooks, lectures, etc., instills in students, again, there's that disconnect. So it's important that we try to be innovative in sparking genuine curiosity and knowledge, like absorbing information for the long term and not just for a test. There is nothing more ingrained in my mind from school than the multiplication songs I learned in the third grade, or the song that states all the United States in alphabetical order. There's something to take from that. Okay, back to edits roots. Let's talk film and TV. Euphoria launched in 2019, and it was the first show that edits seemed to have a huge impact on. The show's hashtag has nearly 70 billion views, and you'll see the vast majority of videos under it are edits. Even hashtag Euphoria edit has nearly 9 billion views on its own. TikTok edits are deeply ingrained into the culture of TV and film now. 
Like this person stated, when you finish an underrated show and there's absolutely no edits to be found while showing frustration. That video has more than 7 million views and 2 million likes. Crazy reach, crazy ratio. Lionsgate, the entertainment company behind projects like Divergent, Twilight, and many others, famously leaned in to the power of edits on their TikTok account to market the new Hunger Games movie. The sentiment was overwhelmingly positive, with people saying things like, no, because Lionsgate marketing of the Hunger Games was so unreal. I swear Lionsgate TikTok is run by a teenage girl. All their TikToks make me want to go watch the movie. Literally the only reason I watched all the Hunger Games movies, and I love them now. While their account is filled with edits focused on characters or moments from the movie, the most popular garnered more than 12 million views and 2 million likes. Pretty little thing, but it's determined. Some people call it swamp potato, but I think Katniss has a much nicer ring, don't you? Oh, oh, you bitches thought But an even more fascinating application of edits within film and TV was when an editor started one of the biggest trends of 2022. The literal day that the show Wednesday launched on Netflix, an editor was inspired by episode four and clipped together moments from Wednesday's dance scene to a sped up version of Lady Gaga's song, Bloody Mary. The song utilized in the actual scene is Goo Goo Muck by The Cramps, but the internet now thinks otherwise. This edit ended up garnering more than 138 million views and 12 million likes. But not only that, it started a TikTok trend where people would do the Wednesday dance to Lady Gaga's song. Under the editor's sound, there are now 3.9 million posts. That is utterly insane. Lady Gaga ended up doing the trend, and Jenna Ortega, who plays Wednesday, was asked about the phenomenon continuously in interviews to the point where she was just overwhelmed. I mean, the dance, the can we talk about the dance, the when's the dance, the Wednesday yeah, dance? You want to. Yeah, I mean, it's everything on TikTok right now. Right now, if you go on TikTok, it's you dancing. Do you go down the TikTok rabbit hole and look at all the people doing it? No, I can't be on TikTok. I can't I can't look into all of that stuff. I, I think good or bad, it's probably not a healthy place to be. So how many people of note have done your dance already? I saw Lady Gaga. I saw I mean, you must trip out on all the people that have done the Wednesday dance, right? Yeah, I feel like I can't escape it now. I've seen <laughs> practically everyone do it, and I've seen some really incredible um, iterations. You choreographed the Wednesday dance that went viral, right? Yes, I did. Can you show me real quick? You was just like, you was like, you was like, you was like, you was like. Honestly, this, this is really well written. I just, I don't feel like I want to do the Wednesday dance for promo because we've seen so much of that already, and I think it's time to do something new. Mm. Yeah. You know? I to yes. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. We yes. didn't want to do the dance either, so. Oh, I, okay, I just didn't know because you're all dressed exactly like Wednesday. This editor not only played a role in skyrocketing the show's prominence, but also Jenna Ortega's fame. To this day, they might be one of the most notable edit accounts with more than 1.6 million followers and frequently going viral. Next, let's cover business. I want to hop between entertainment industry examples and otherwise. And this next example is like the epitome of TikTok. In March of 2023, TikTok CEO Sho Chu testified before Congress, and the hearing was focused on three things. One, TikTok's relationship to the Chinese Communist Party. Two, TikTok's privacy and data security practices. And three, TikTok's impact on younger users. This was the first hearing that TikTok had been the sole focus of since its rise to prominence in the United States. The hearing was five hours long, and within those five hours, not only commentators, but also editors, flooded the TikTok For You page with their reactions. Let's watch a few. The public profile, um, to go through the videos that they post to see whether- well, That's creepy. Tell me more about that. It's public. <laughs> TikTok access the home Wi-Fi network. TikTok will remain a place for free expression and will not be manipulated by any government. Them LA boys, they wanna fuck, they wanna fuck. Them New York boys, they wanna fuck, they wanna fuck.
We don't accept money. I don't think other platforms can say that. Show Chu was CEO for two years before the hearing. No one paid him any mind, had no idea who he was. And just like that, he gets thirst trap edits. Some were even pitting big tech companies against each other, and like facts, but it's just funny. The issue here, with a lot of respect, American social companies don't have a good track record with data privacy and user security. Let me look at Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> While these are objectively funny, and TikTok users are of course going to be biased in the TikTok national security debate, this phenomenon can be worrisome. Instead of consuming the full scope of conversation, we're not only consuming bite-sized clips that eliminate nuance, but we're consuming edits that again bypass our analytical thinking and go straight to our emotions. The TikTok CEO was being abruptly romanticized and idolized. Meanwhile, during the actual hearing, he was still pulling typical business tactics to make the positioning of his company seem better than it is. We spent a lot of time adopting measures to protect teenagers. Many of those measures are firsts for the social media industry. We, for we forbid direct messaging for people under 16, and we have a 16-minute watch time by default for those under 18. As I mentioned in this video, the 16-minute watch time callout is misleading. It's very easy to bypass, and it was implemented just days before the hearing so that TikTok could use it as a point in their favor. Its implementation did not come from genuine motive. As exemplified in the education example, someone could very well make an edit that portrays a quick-paced, objective overview of the full hearing, communicates what TikTok did well, communicates what they didn't do well, and it can garner just as much attention as a show to thirst trap. But legacy media, the ball's in your court. You gotta hire TikTok editors to make edits of your journalist stories. I'm kidding. Ish. It's up for debate. Moving on to music, edits are having a unique impact on this industry. Let's use Aaliyah's Interludes debut single as an example. Aaliyah has been known across platforms for her personality and fashion, so getting into music was definitely a risk, as many social media personalities receive backlash for doing so. But as soon as I heard a preview of her song It Girl, I knew it would be a hit. Take a listen. Bitch, you know I'm sexy. Ugh, don't call, just text me. Bitches slow, can't get on my speed. They stare cause they know I'm the I-T-G-I-R-L. You know I am that girl. Shh, bitch don't kiss and tell. <laughs> it girl from ATL. I-T-G-I-R-L. You know I am that girl. Shh, bitch don't kiss and tell. It girl from ATL. With more than 70 million Spotify streams in three months and one million posts under the TikTok sound, it was the most viral song worldwide. It Girl did in fact become a hit. And while the song has been utilized in a wide range of TikTok videos, my thought for why it was gonna be successful is because it is perfect for various genres of edits. Obviously, It Girl edits, fashion model edits, a lot of them. Bitch, you know I'm sexy. Ugh, don't call, just text me. Bitches slow, can't get on my speed. They stare cause they know I'm the I-T-G-I-R-L. Right on cue, Aaliyah even ended up leaning into this during continued promotion. That aside, when it became evident how much TikTok runs the music charts after 2020, there became this pressure for artists to create moments within their work that could spark some sort of trend, often aimed at dance or humor. And there's been a lot of debate around this, the contrast between TikTok maxing and creativity, but it's a double-edged sword because simultaneously, TikTok is where users have discovered so much of their favorite music, it's further boosted true artistry in outer space, for example, a song like Resonance 
or a Taylor Swift song that was already successful in its own right. In regards to creating a song that resonates on TikTok, things like dance trends are far less prevalent. They're like extinct at the moment. But I think a new aim for artists is going to be creating songs that are good for edits. Someone responded to this thought saying, it's just a new version of making songs for ringtones. And while I agree, because I read that and was like, that's a good thought. Simultaneously, I think it more so relates to the saying, I see the vision. So many of the songs that we're attracted to are not only the songs that make us feel something, but the songs that make us see something. They take you somewhere. You imagine yourself in a scenario, a music video. But now it's not only that, it's also how you can envision a song being utilized in a TikTok edit. And whether it be CapCut or other editing softwares, you can now quickly bring that vision to life, share it, and potentially reach an audience more easily than ever before. So while I don't think something like Aaliyah's song would have had success, nor even made sense 15 years ago, it makes a lot of sense now. I hinted at its impact on politics at the beginning, but let's touch on it a little bit more. The other month I saw this tweet asking, is the next US presidential election coming down to who has stronger memes? I had to clarify and say, it's not gonna be about the memes, it's gonna be about the TikTok edits. Here are some examples. We are America, second to none, and we own the finish line. <laughs> From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. America first. America first. America first. How do you do that in a debate with Donald Trump? Play. Well, first of all, <clears throat> Let's not pretend that he would do Only on them seas if it's breeze. Red will be the sleeve. Chinese on my sleeve. These wanna be Chun Leaves anyway. Anybody say that I'm an amateur at what they do? They're an amateur. What they do. Fuck they're an amateur. 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 They're an but in the same way that podcasts play a role in platforming and giving reach to those who are not being platformed by legacy media, TikTok plays a role in doing the same. And while first-person approaches are great, like what Representative Jeff Jackson does to keep people informed on what's going on in Congress, again, third-person point of view content, whether it be through clips or edits, ends up being far more powerful on the psyche. A candidate who's experienced this so far is Marianne Williamson. She's only posted 65 videos on TikTok, yet has drawn more than 12 million views, according to TikTok Data Counter. Uh, but there are also endless Marianne Stan accounts that post her speeches and rack up massive numbers. And she has grown an enormous following on TikTok as a result. And remember, when it comes to elections, young people are playing a bigger role. Uh, they made all the difference in the midterm elections and could potentially make all the difference in the upcoming presidential election in 2024. This was happening throughout early 2023, but the thing with US presidential campaigns is candidates start so early and with the attention economy, they go viral and then often it causes overexposure or people get bored because the action element is so far away, which also gives them room to move their attention elsewhere. Regardless, in the same way that John Fetterman and Dr. Oz had their teams memeing back and forth during their Senate race, there's bound to be a candidate in the future that leans into the power of an Andrew Tate-esque strategy where your team creates a shit ton of accounts and or is able to create a culture where people opt into creating accounts that post third-person point of view content of the candidate. So clips from elsewhere, edits, and so on, creating an opportunity to take up a lot of real estate on people's feeds. Again, in your gut, something might not sit right when hearing that, but if someone's opponent is doing it, or is inadvertently having it done for them, because let's remember that comment from early on about nonstop political edits about what you are for or against. To what extent do they have to play into the game, but with their twist, to achieve the net impact they want to make? There's a potential sweet spot that is moral, informative, and not corny at least for this moment in time. You always look back and you're like, yes. Last example section, and it should be quick, personal narratives. Okay, so some people love to declare who they think would be a good couple. If you're on the receiving end of that, it can be weird, especially if you don't see things the same way. Through edits, this narrative building 
is intensified. Tana Mojo and Jeff Wittick are being shipped by a lot of their fans. Tana joined YouTube in 2015 and has blown up across platforms since, while Jeff Wittick used to be a part of the vlog squad, amongst other things, and continues to have a strong individual internet presence. The two have become good friends, and Tana often appears on Jeff's podcast. Let's watch some edits. Uh, yeah, well, you saw it all happen. You saw, like, uh, my majority of friends, you know, that, that changed up a lot. I found her perfect time. You know, she got me out of the house because I don't want to do shit. People who don't tune in to their long form content often think they're an item because of what they see on TikTok. And this is what Tana had to say about that. I keep getting tagged, <laughs> obviously always in the fan edits of Jeff and I. I think it's so mentally damaging to be severely shipped with someone. Yeah, I think, God, somebody else talked about this one time, but it's like almost like you start to like look at, and it's like, wait, are we looking at each other that way? Like it makes you like completely reassess your reality with someone and I, that's how I feel about our relationship. I, I read the comments and I'm like, shit, do I hate her? <laughs> <laughs> I see these edits and I'm like, wait, that is a beautiful couple. Not even that. I'm uh -oh. just like, it does. It just makes you like reassess so many conversations and memories. And it's like, no, but I like feel the like way I, they edit this shit, though, I'm like, they could convince me that I'm like head over heels in love with like Ari. Yeah, that's fair. That is like, fair. just like the laughs and like the looks at each other in the slow mo with the songs. I'm like, wait. And it's just it, it's just. Yeah. And then we'll like feed into it. It's just this whole. I just think this is notable because it shows how Edit's emotional impact is not just on the audience, but also the individuals involved and how weird it can be on the psyche. One last, very recent point for personal narratives. Coverage of Gypsy Rose Blanchard went wildly viral throughout December 2023, awaiting her release from prison after eight years. There have been various documentaries and even a miniseries about her situation over the years, but Gypsy Rose persuaded an online boyfriend to kill her mother after she had forced her to pretend for years that she was suffering from leukemia, muscular dystrophy, and other serious illnesses. The internet has been rallying behind her, and Gypsy Rose's TikTok hashtags have garnered over 5 billion views. Most of the popular videos are edits celebrating her. What did the Facebook post say? She's having quite the unique and bizarre life experience. But yeah, this is modern journalism, guys. Get with the times. I have to add this because it's risen up over the past week. Religion, when it comes to edits. There are now Scientology edits, but not even like Scientology edits. People are making characters of the front desk employees at a Scientology office in LA. And not just the front desk employees, also the people on the sidewalks who are giving out brochures, sharing information about their religion, or cult. What is Scientology? Don't listen to me about, like, the information behind that. But I'm just saying, in regards to whatever it is, people are making characters out of these everyday employees, blasting them across the internet without their consent, and making just edits out of them, like thirst trap edits again, like storyline edits. Like I said, literally making them into characters. What is the internet? Okay, moving on to the end. Those are all the examples I have for you. Edits are seeping into every realm of life. To bring things full circle, the creator of Star Wars, George Lucas, actually predicted the rise of edits back in 1995 before he even experienced the Phantom edit. Listen here. Crossing into the digital age is, is the big move here. And I think it'll be the biggest thing that's happened uh, while I've been making movies. I mean, I equate it to the invention of color or sound. I think there's going to be some social uh, changes that take place uh, due to the internet, due to the, the uh, kind of uh, uh, availability of the tools to more and more people. Uh, I think uh, 
you're going to find a lot of people recutting movies and changing them, moving them around, making them into their own movies, uh, all kinds of strange things that are hard to contemplate at this point. Um, and there'll be delivery systems that are way, way different. Um, but in terms of the process of the, the primary process of making a movie, once we get through this this digital revolution, um, I think it should stay pretty much like that for um, well, at least the next 20 or 30 years. Um, it's hard to tell, but I, I think the biggest issue is going to be uh, how the movies get into the marketplace and then what happens to them once they're there. Because I don't think it's going to be a sit down hands off situation anymore. I think it's going to be people uh, sort of reinventing the movies once they're out there. How this works for the artist, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, you know, what it does to the marketplace, I don't know. Uh, but it's, we're living very exciting times, and, and I look forward to seeing how this whole thing evolves. It's pretty wild how spot on that train of thought was, and I'm so curious his thoughts on how short form has shifted this as well. So what's next for edits? We're certainly going to see their prominence continue to grow as they aim to maximize what's most entertaining and interesting across industries, for better or worse. But regardless, it is an art form and it is a form of curation. An obvious next step is the use of generative AI to enhance whatever narrative and or frequency is being portrayed. To George Lucas's point, we're already seeing this iteration. An example is the YouTube channel Glorb that launched six months ago and creates generative AI videos utilizing SpongeBob characters and self-produced drill music videos. They're very good. When questioning the legality of something like this, a quote from a New York Times piece titled Thinking Thoughts is Prohibited relates. Why does American law increasingly protect the interests of the old guard over those of the vanguard? After all, new art always borrows from old. Shakespeare's Hamlet was a remake. Picasso created collages from torn up newspapers. Rappers rhyme over bass lines lifted from funk songs. If that's the way culture works, why does the law so often stand in the way? Though it's important to note, a problem that arises for individuals and not characters is identity protection and personal peace. But we'll talk about that another time. As visions become easier to execute through generative AI because there are increasingly less barriers to create complex media, that quote, everything you need is already within you, begins to apply digitally, which is cool to think about. In the meantime, keep your eyes peeled for how edits are evolving on your feeds and how they shift your personal information landscape. Thank you all so much for watching, seriously, and I'll see you next time.